Uh, good morning and welcome to The Lip, the Leadership and Insurance podcast. Um, I'm very lucky today to be joined by Marco De Carlo um, of Capacity Place. Um, Capacity Place is a really interesting marketplace concept um, which falls within the bracket of insure techs, but um, I'm not sure what doesn't these days. But um, um, I, I was very lucky to speak to Marco um, a couple of days ago um, and found out a little bit more about the platform, um, but he can explain more um, later in the podcast. Um, but ostensibly, it's a marketplace that connects capacity seekers with capacity providers. And certainly in my experience, that's something that's, um, that's definitely lacking in the market. So, um, but before I go on, um, Marco, welcome to the podcast. Alex, thank you for having me. Yeah, no good. problem. No problem. So I, I wanted to, we obviously want to get to Capacity Place and, and I'm, I'm really excited uh, about talking about it. Um, but I always want to start on people's journeys into insurance because everyone's different. Um, but you, you, didn't, you didn't come from insurance from the start point. You started in management consultancy, is that right? Yeah, I had, I mean, I'm, I'm kidding in my background and started my life at uh, Ernst & Young, then Accenture, uh, and back in the 90s, I actually did write a, uh, an underwriting program um, back then mm -hmm. uh, for workers' compensation, uh, which mm -hmm. is my sort of first foray. So I'm more of a financial services process technology specialist by background mm -hmm. uh, who had been in management consultancy a number of years, had launched a few different companies in different ways. And so for me, it was always about that combination of how can you do things better, smarter, faster, cheaper, utilizing data, and is that concept of risk. So it's just a better way of assessing, running, uh, understanding risk, quantifying it one way or another, uh, and then finding better ways uh, in which to manage that accordingly. And that's mm -hmm. what sort of led me into underwriting. But I've done a lot of work in various other aspects of financial services mm -hmm. uh, in terms of credit cards. I spent a number of years at American Express, Bax, the UK ACH, which uh, handles all the direct debit standing orders. I restructured that. I did a bunch of work in um, in investment banking, in retail banking, uh, in mortgages before I really stepped into insurance. Um, and when I stepped in, I, I was actually a strategic advisor to a number of insurance companies for several years um, in, in in all various aspects. And then I and then I, back around 2008 2009, I was actually looking at doing a buy and build of Lloyd's Brokers mm -hmm. and I just saw that there was a very fragmented industry um, in the Lloyd's Broking market um, where it came down to, you know, can you create a scaled broking operation? And that then introduced me into the London market and my eyes completely opened mm -hmm. to this world that I'd never seen before really mm -hmm. of, you know, of specialists. It was almost like walking into uh, a medical center and having a brain surgeon over here a um, you know a ear nose and throat specialist there a podiatrist there etc cetera, etc cetera. everything was very very specialized in the world where you just had small teams of a few people that were experts in a particular area and i found that really exciting because when i stepped into the london market i just went wow is this ever a massively disorganized world that's <laughs> out there and there is way better ways of doing this yeah, I, I think that's the benefit of coming from outside it. I mean, uh, that's where I, that's where you see the efficiencies and, that, and that's what you're seeing now. I mean, even coming from, you know, just 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 being a graduate and, and working in recruitment. And then um, I did have a little stint um, in, in, in insurance, but not in the Lloyd's market. And then I walked into Lloyd's for the first time. I went on my tour um, and I just remember looking at these guys in massive suitcases and go, oh, where are they going? And they went, no, they're not going anywhere. They're carrying paper. <laughs> and and even, uh, even as a sort of, you know, early 20s grad, I was like, that doesn't seem entirely efficient. You know, just, just on that level alone, I was just like, this seems like a bad idea. So for someone that comes from a digital, you know, process improvement, efficiency background, it must have been, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's either a dream or a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what, what I could see essentially was, um, I could see kind of where other areas of financial services were going. Mm. Um, and it's, part of it's a combination of process efficiency using technology. Like the mortgage market had really moved and shifted electronically. We used to have a whole series of mortgage brokers. And then what happened was, um, you know, all the standard mortgages went online. And then every year it became, you know, the, it, more complex types of mortgages went online, moved online, 
you know, every year a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So the online, you know, start to disintermediate, if you will, the, the traditional mortgage broker. You can see that aspect coming at it. Equally from the, you know, from a hedge fund market perspective, most of the hedge funds that are out there are, you know, super smart people who are crunching, you know, who are using algorithms to better understand and assess risk. And what was going on in that world, a little bit different than, than insurance, but basically you had a lot of, uh, sort of proprietary traders that were working for the large investment banks. Mm -hmm. So they would work for the Morgan Stanleys, JP Morgan's, Goldman Sachs. And after a few years, they would just get, they were, they'd be making their employers basically lots of money, uh, but then get really frustrated and kind of go, look, I want to set up my own shop and do that. So they'd want to be, you know, step from being a proprietary trader to setting up a, their own hedge fund. The problem is that in order to set up their own hedge fund, you know, you had to have a whole set of infrastructure. You had to have, umbrella regulatory cover, et cetera, et cetera. So around the turn of the century, one of the things that started emerging were these companies called um, hedge fund hotels, which were basically kind of like, you know, they took care of all of the compliance operations. Um, they took care of, you know, your Bloomberg terminals, et cetera, et cetera. So the hedge fund basically, or the you know, proprietary traders of small groups could come in and, and what their job was to do was to bring in capital, and then invest accordingly into books of business. Mm -hmm. right? It sits sort of into, into different investments and make money in that way. Mm -hmm. And I could see kind of a parallel, if you will, into our world of creating an MGA environment kind of like that as well, mm -hmm. which is, you know, basically you kind of, rather than having a hedge fund hotel, you basically have an MGA management company, and then you have different underwriters, and the underwriters are experts in what they do, mm -hmm. um, that are experts at delivering underwriting profit, but need all the infrastructure, uh, if you will, in order to for that to happen. And so that was that you know combination of better risk assessment, better understanding, in concert with a new operating model in terms of ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And it was just sort of a you know it was an operating model change that I think we've seen in the industry evolve. And over the last sort of ten years or so, certainly in the MGA world. There's been a number of cell-based companies and MGAs that have evolved on that basis. But there's sort of a dividing line between the management of the MGA, if you will, and the underwriting discipline that's required. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's interesting looking at the hedge fund model as well, because um, yeah, as, as someone that's always, I've always been in the room when I've worked for um, other companies with people that are probably focusing on hedge fund markets, you know, recruiting things like quants. If you see where that trajectory has gone using your analogy, is that you know the quantitative trading, the algorithmic trading has replaced the kind of manualness, and 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 you've really got to reflect that back on insurance and go, you know that's 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 again the pathway, and obviously we're starting to see that you know the fact that we've seen Key come out of um, Brit, and you've essentially got the first algorithmically driven, um, you know that it's not an underwriting model. It's uh, well, sorry, it's not it's not there's not room full of underwriters. It's a model that you know is a follow market play. Um, but using kind of an, an algorithm to trade. Um, we, we're going to have to see more of that. It's a, it's a sort of natural progression. Um, so, um, but, but I don't, I don't want to get to the future too quickly because I, I, okay. I want to come back. So you're, you're, when you were management consultancy, was, was that purely in, in Canada or had you already made the move to the UK at that point? Um, so uh, I, I had uh, both, in fact. So I did, did it in Canada. Uh, and then when I moved to the UK, I had uh, spent a few years at American Express, and then I joined an interactive agency that, strange enough, put the first banner out on the web back in 1993. Went back <laughs> a long ways, uh, and then I was, <laughs> and then I was sort of an independent consultant, independent management consultant yeah. for several years, yeah. um, working in a variety of financial, primarily financial services, um, with a slight technology bent um, mm. to that. But you, so you joined, you joined the broking world first, didn't you? The insurance broking world, is that right? Uh, sort of, yeah. I mean, there is so around the 2007, 2008 timeframe, I was actually looking to set up a, a, a VC firm. Oh, this um, and the VC firm um, with a few partners of mine, and we were raising capital to doing that. It was just the absolute wrong time in the market. I mean, 2008 came. Uh, first time fund, but the, the, the fund was very much focused on how do you take companies, sort of scale them up, but um, drive operational improvements, which is, which is really where 
our, you know, myself and, and some partners, where our strengths were, which was how can you transform companies and make them, you know, leaner, better, smarter, more focused accordingly. Yeah. And that was the, the essence around what we were trying to do mm -hmm. uh, accordingly. But the timing of it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Through that, though, came um, some co connections that I had in the world of insurance where there was a, one of the companies that I, that, I, that I was working with was a Lloyd's broker who'd just gone through a management bio. And they were very much focused on the wholesale and UK marketplace. And so I spent a year with them being their corporate development director. So focused on M&A, acquiring a few companies, selling a few companies within the group, um, and starting a few different ventures uh, with them. And it's all, it was all small stuff, but it was that whole bit of how do you take a company and then you know, look to refocus it on, uh, on sort of a longer term strategy in terms of where you want to go. Mm -hmm. From that, that was then really my entry into London market. Yeah. So that was a 2009 timeframe. So. Yeah. So after then, uh, is that when you set, set up Tempo um, um, Underwriting? Uh, no. So that's when I set up a company called JRP uh, Underwriting. And uh, JRP was a team that was at another MJ and they were unhappy with where they were at. So uh, myself, uh, I had set up a, a JRP with the management team uh, jointly um, to set up an, an MGA that was focusing on UK and Irish commercial property risks. Mm -hmm. the, we kind of had a different difference of opinions. Like I, I basically focused on building out the infrastructure for it um, and all that. And the, whereas the team already had existing book, existing relationships uh, and the like. And, and we had sort of a different vision for the business. Mm -hmm. I wanted to grow a multi-line MGA business, creating what I would call a Lloyd syndicate outside of Lloyd's model, where again, you bring in different teams, et cetera, et cetera. The management team kind of had, they just wanted to keep things as, uh, you know, as such. So that we didn't quite see eye to eye on a lot of this. And it just, it became frustrating over a period of time. Um, so we ended up parting ways um, after a few years. They continued on with the business. Uh, I left and at that stage was looking to create that vision basically. And that's really where the vision for Tempo came from. Was that, was out of the, I suppose, the frustration out of the first MGA learnings from it. Um, you know, what works, what doesn't. Uh, and then over that period, I kind of went, right, if we're going to set up a multi-line MGA on a model that is more like the Lloyd syndicate outside of Lloyd's, we need to have the right people uh, around the table in terms of right partners that want to make this happen, um, that are, you know, that have, that share the same vision. And then what we'll do is we'll bring in different underwriters or underwriting teams into that model. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get, so we, Basically, you know, it took about a year to get the right people around the table. You know, I wasn't, you know, having just gone through what I went through, I wasn't about to rush into something yeah. um, right away. So it was just, I wanted to make sure that everybody was lined up and committed to the same vision. And if you are, then you can, then you can get it going. Mm. Um, and yeah, like, that's, that's such an important point. And um, there's something that I'm, you know, it was, it was my experience. I, I, I set up my first business in recruitment with a partner. Um, and he's a great guy and he's, he's very good at his job and, and, but he, we set up with a plan to say, right, we we're going to grow, we were going to grow a sort of a significant business and we were going to focus on that kind of mid to senior level, um, and compete in the insurance space. And, and uh, over time, we were very lucky, we were very successful out the gate, um, but we were focusing on senior level search and he just didn't want the same thing. You know, he was, he was a bit older and he was like, look, look, I want a smaller business focused on senior search which was not what I'd gone into it for. So it's not even a case of, I think people make these assumptions that these things are quite dramatic, but it's, it's not about kind of a clash of personalities all the time. It's just, you, you, everyone needs to be on the same page about what you're trying to achieve um, and be very clear about that. Because any deviation from that, then you're pulling at the resources and that's where the sort of stress and, stress and pressure comes from, in my experience. Um, and I see that in MGA models, anything entrepreneurial that's in the, you know, insure techs, for example. Um, you've absolutely, um, I think that's the key thing, isn't it? You've got to be on the same page from day one. Um, and it's got to be very clear what that is as well. Because um, I think people like to fudge things and go, let's just get going, let's just go. Um, but actually, it's so important to get that right. Yeah, choosing partners, I think, is one of the lessons that I've had, that I've learned over many years, 
Um, having choose the wrong partners um, several times, you, you learn from that. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where you kind of say, do I do it myself or do I do it with others? If you do it with others, what are the, the other skills, capabilities that you want to bring on board? Do you share the same values and culture uh, in terms of how to drive business forward? Is it complementary? And mm -hmm. it's hard to get to know people like that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd always seen myself as someone who was, you know, analytical, could always get things done, operationally strong, but I was never really a good salesman. Mm -hmm. um, that was never my strength. Uh, at least I, I felt that way. Um, up until about 2008, 2009, um, that I just never saw myself as the front person. What I needed, well, I was a great number two, yeah. basically. And, I, and I, what I needed is a number one who was, who was a, a far more, they were better at the politics, better at the salesmanship than I was. And that sort of changed, I think, around that 2008, 2009 period for me. Um, because as we started to then focus on this uh, BC fund that I was mentioning to you um, mm -hmm. and getting that going, we were changing around the model. And I started to realize that when we started looking at where did most of the opportunities come from that came into that, most of them came from me and my network. Mm -hmm. And it was that bit of it where what I saw was that people were backing me, my understanding um, and how it all worked just because I just had such an extensive network and I knew how, how it all fit together. Yeah. And that for me was sort of a wake up moment for me, which is, wow, I can do this. I, I just, I didn't see myself in this light and now I do. Um, and so that's, an, that sort of changed things for me in terms of actually I can go out and do this. And a little bit of it is, you know, is, is self-confidence and mm -hmm. you know, in who you are. Um, and there's always things that I think that, that eat away at different people, um, you know, areas that everybody's got concerns around you know for me that was that was probably it you know was getting out there i was never the business developer and i, I didn't see myself in that light but after that i think things changed significantly and then i felt a lot more comfortable with it yeah yeah so you're you're sitting there you've got the right partners around the table for tempo um and wh when did tempo start when did when did you start business in 2012 2012 and so what was what was the so the plan was from day one to be a multi-line um business yeah so the the plan for tempo was to build out uh, sometimes we would describe it as a lloyd syndicate outside of lloyd's yes so yes. it was it was um specialty lines where we bring in underwriters underwriting teams that were specialists in a particular area mm -hmm. we're quite agnostic to it um what we're looking for was teams that delivered you know, significant amounts of underwriting profit, had a very clear methodology as to how they underwrote business, mm -hmm. uh, outperformed peers, and had, you know, low or no ego. And that was sort of the criteria around them. Um, to, to take a step back, there was sort of, you know, whenever you launch this, you kind of have a plan, if you will, um, plan of attack. And so for us, there was three main planks that needed to be established in order for, for Tempo to be successful. The first one is that you needed to have a plug and play operating environment. So that plug and play operating environment is, you know, is a combination of all your processes, technology, the, you know, your back office capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, in place. Um, for us, that wasn't an issue because myself and partners were all very competent. Sorry. The second thing is you need to have a pipeline of different teams that were looking to move. And when we started, we didn't know how many teams were going to be looking out there, you know, how many underwriters, underwriting teams were looking to um, to, uh, to establish, to move, to looking for a better environment. Mm -hmm. The third thing is that you need to have capacity. And capacity is probably the single biggest challenge around that. Mm -hmm. So on the second one around, you know, what the pipeline of teams, uh, we were inundated. So it was one of those ones where, you know, we quickly learned actually finding people um, that were looking to move. They were, they were a dime a dozen. Um, they're all over the place. That's, that was the easy bit. You had to assess them and you know look to see is is what they're having a value is it not a value there's some lines of business that are mga friendly and some that aren't um so you know you know mga business favor tends to favor shorter tail non-cat low volatility they have to fit certain size and scale in order for it to be valuable to a capacity provider uh, and the like and what we found is that over time about one out of every six propositions that we looked at fit the model and the other five out of six didn't. And, mm. and generally speaking, you were looking for MGAs or underwriting teams that were looking for a better environment where they couldn't do something within their current environment because they were constrained. 
Mm. What we found was an awful lot of people that we you know had were let go from their jobs. They were follow line underwriters. They were just looking for big salaries and looking to switch from one to the other, et cetera, et cetera. All of those people were just, you know, no, 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 no. Didn't quite have, didn't quite have the, the things that we were looking for, which was a, what we would call as a lift and shift book um, or opportunity to bring that over. Clear underwriting methodology, understanding, you know, where underwriting profits are being delivered. Um, you know, where is it that you target? Um, why are you constrained with, with, within your current environment? Um, so why can't you do what you want to be doing um, that's there? If, if they're current, or currently employed, sometimes there were uh, certain events that would take place in the market, either capacity downgrades, M&A, all those activities, which mean that, that there, there was underwriting teams that were moving by mm -hmm. dint of corporate transactions. Mm -hmm. Those are usually the best opportunities. Yeah. So on, on the team side of it, that's basically what we looked at. The third leg was around capacity and having, uh, you know, if I can call it capacity on tap. And that was probably the single hardest thing. Mm. Now, most of the market as a whole uses brokers to secure capacity. Some of the challenges, so our, our approach was we use brokers uh, occasionally, but what we want to do is establish direct relationships with different insurers. Uh, and so we spent a lot of our time, certainly during the first few years, uh, cultivating relationships with, you know, hundreds of, of different insurers, going and approaching them directly to say, look, we're Tempo, this is what we're doing. You're not going to back us today. That's fine. But we want to, we know that, you know, you're, by establishing a relationship now, when we then approach you with something that fits in a couple of years time, you'll know who we are. We have a relationship. You've been following us. And you know what you understand we're doing. And that, that pretty much worked. Um, so we spent a lot of our time in Baden-Baden, in Monte Carlo, having an awful lot of coffees in EC3, um, just meeting lots of different people uh, in the market to explain, you know, our model, what we're doing, what we're focused on accordingly. Mm. So that was quite, you know, that was, that, was, uh, that was quite useful. The challenge always came down to with capacity was, was you know, usually books of business are profitable because there's a supply demand imbalance in a particular market segment. Mm. Usually because there's a supply demand imbalance um, within that, carriers, it, it came down to finding capacity for that. And carriers weren't necessarily looking at profitability in the same way that we were. Like we would look at books of business and say, does it deliver a high return on capital employee? And carriers weren't. That's not how they were thinking. Well, carriers were, the way that most carriers work is they were looking for incremental distribution for what they currently write today. Right. So if, if they write, you know, UK property, what they're looking for is other UK property business in a particular segment that, in, that they don't write. And a lot of times we were looking at books of business that were delivering unbelievable returns, but needed to have an openness among, among most carriers that they just didn't have. Mm -hmm. So we found it kind of very frustrating on the capacity side. Um, because what we were doing wasn't quite aligned with what they were doing. It didn't fit into the normal distribution channel model that most carriers uh, work on mm -hmm. accordingly. So we kind of had to change our approach um, in terms of that. So for example, most carriers, if you talk to most underwriters in the market, they don't understand how much capital they hold against their line of business. So therefore don't quite have an understanding of what the return on capital employed was. So we would look at things like an investor going, well, this is delivering amazing returns. You should back it. Meanwhile, the underwriters were, weren't thinking like that at all. They were like, well, I write this book of business. What I'm looking for is a segment that we're not in today. The capital side of it, well, that's somewhere in finance or capital management that looks at that. I have no idea. <laughs> so those are some of the challenges I think that we had early on that we then started to drop. And as we started to learn, we then kind of refined our model to say, right, we need to focus on books of business that align with how carriers are prepared to delegate authority, not necessarily financially what makes sense. That model was more akin to if you were a carrier looking to start up a new line of business, what line of business would you like to start up? Mm. So mm. it's a little bit different. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you're, you're basically coming with a proposition that makes sense, but, but they're, they're just saying, no, that's not the way we look at it. But, um, but that's an important part of, you know, it comes back to the thing of not being a salesman, but that's, that's a huge part of sales is you can go and sell the thing that you think is the value add to your client or client base. Um, but you've got to take that feedback on board, haven't you? And say, 
if they're saying that's not what we're interested in, but we're interested in looking at it from a different perspective, you know, you need to kind of move with their perspective because otherwise you're not going to, you're not going to move forward. Um, so look, yeah, Tempo, just to, you, you ran it for a long time, eight years or so? Because it's, st it's still an existing entity. You've, you've just moved on to start Capacity Place. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So obviously you're at you're at Tempo. Things are going well. It's it's, it's an established business. Um, why why take this leap of faith? What why this idea? Um, and obviously I think some of it's touched on what you've just what we've just been talking about. You know the challenge for capacity. Um, you know why why was it this idea and what what why now? Uh, well, a couple of questions in there. So, um, so first of all, there, there were a number of opportunities that myself and, and a key partner of mine at Tempo had been looking at, mm -hmm. um, first up. So one was we were actually looking at setting up a risk carrier uh, that focused on program business to address many of the opportunities that we were already looking at. So that was you know, underwriting programs and fronting opportunities as such. And so we, we were chatting with a few different investors and um, you know about that, and we just couldn't get that over the line, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But what came back was was constantly this friction between capacity seekers and capacity providers in terms of this mat, you know matching process that most MGAs, delegated authority businesses, and to a certain extent, um, some students who who were looking for treaty placements were struggling to find capacity for their books of business. Um, at the same time, many of the insurers, reinsurers. ILS markets and the like were struggling to get access to business. And it you know, sort of struck me that there was, a, there was a massive disconnect in the market. And so um, around sort of the, the turn of last year, so 2000, at the beginning of 2019, um, or just before that, if I take it six months back from that, Lloyd's had launched an initiative called Lloyd's Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you were familiar with this, but Lloyd's Bridge was, was an initiative whereby Lloyd's turned around and said, if you have a good idea, then um, send it to us, and then we'll basically route that to different syndicates. And they ran a pilot of that between about sort of July, August 2018 and January 2019. They had about, I think, 40 submissions in for that, and about, I think, one of them turned into a program. And off the back of that, they then turned around and said, let's create a, you know, let's, let's then formalize this and create this as an opportunity and expand this out. That sort of died an early death um, about a month afterwards because the brokers, you know, most of the Lloyd's brokers said, look, you're just cutting us out of the loop here. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to support it. Many of the syndicates didn't want to support it because they just saw this as another centrally designed Lloyd's initiative. Uh, but the idea was good. And someone in my office that had then turned around and said, yeah, this Lloyd's Bridge idea is a, is a really good idea, but it should be available across the entirety of the market. And that's when my mind just went, bam, that's it. Yeah. I said, we should create a marketplace for capacity, mm -hmm. for, you know, for insurance program capacity. And they went, huh? I don't understand. And I was like, okay, so there's, a, you know, there's massive issues in terms of, uh, of, of cover holders and sedents trying to find capacity, yet on the other side, there's this. And so I was trying to explain it, and it was like, okay, so this, this really isn't working. Mm -hmm. but, but it was in my head, there was, a, there was a massive disconnect where I could see that a technology-enabled marketplace could serve this so much better than the current ways in which we do things. Yeah, and um, and there was parallels in the world of of other types of investments. So there's companies like Axial.net, Banker Bay that were already doing this in the small ticket M&A space, where if you were looking to buy or sell a company that might have been like you know a, a window washing company or a you know. A, some factory or retail outfit, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge in that is always, how do I find, if I'm looking to sell this, who's looking to buy it and why? So they had already created marketplaces, you know, five, six, seven years ago um, around this, not quite marketplaces, but more like networks. There's networks and marketplaces, sort of that concept, if you will, to say, how can we connect a very, in a very fragmented space, those that have got, assets for sale or looking to raise capital with those that have got money, um, either institutional investors, uh, family offices, or trade, uh, trade buyers, if you will, uh, around them. And so out of that came that concept and I went, huh, I think we could actually take the same type of concept and apply it to the marketplace for capacity. Mm -hmm. So from that point in time, I, I then created this Excel-based model 
um, you know, around sort of the beginning of 2019. Uh, I spent about two months on that to do that. Then built a prototype in WordPress and from that, just myself, and then um, walked around the market and talked to different people about this, this opportunity. And I went, this, and I found myself getting really excited about it, which is usually a very good sign. Yeah. And then I'm talking to different people. I would go to different brokers, different MGAs, different insurers, reinsurers, other people in the market going, well, this is what it is. And everyone's going, this is really good. Nothing like this exists in the market. This is brilliant. So I got a lot of really positive feedback. And that's usually, you know, it's that testing process to doing it. And I'm still doing a few other things. So this is one of the ideas that's kind of going on in my mind. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it was very, very positive encouragement. Mm. The, the one piece of feedback, like, so basically the model we put together was almost universally liked. So it was, it was you know, right up, you, you, like you hit, like from, from my perspective, I felt in testing this, this worked brilliantly well and, um, and everybody's coming back saying all the right positive noises. So then, you know, you ask for feedback, say, okay, what makes it better? What could be improved here? And the one thing that came back, I think, from everyone that we didn't quite have in the model, it was, they said, look, if, if I'm seeking capacity and I'm an MGA or uh, a, a placing broker or whatever, I'm already having conversations in the market. So I need some way of making sure that this doesn't trip over my existing conversations that I'm already having, yeah. uh, that's already taking place. And so for that, we then design that in, um, into the model in the future. But that was the one piece of feedback that we said, okay, this is a real challenge. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna build this capability in there to ensure that we don't cross over with, um, with other, with existing capacity providers that are on there, existing conversations, competitors, or if you have a company that is, uh, you know, if you have teams that are looking to move from a current employer to somewhere else, they don't want the current employer looking at it. So how can we build that into a concept? Because I'm sorry, on, on that point, I think that's where, that's where when we spoke, I, I, I was, this is a common problem. I, I mean, I'm constantly talking to senior underwriters or, or senior underwriting teams that are looking to uh, potentially explore the MGA model. Um, and then always the conversation is, well, can you get capacity? And it's just, it's, it's the great unknown, it's the, it's the risk. So either they have to put their head above water and, and expose themselves a little bit in terms of trying to have those conversations. And then you're not having clarity of conversation either because it's, it's all off the record conversations. It's only having conversations with people that you already know and trust. So therefore you're not exploring the whole marketplace for capacity. Um, and then there's a massive risk factor in that. You know, there's, um, there's a huge kind of conflict about. Um, and so that, that largely prevents people moving. Um, and, and exploring the model. So that's where I kind of saw that straight away. But obviously, there's, there's a much broader kind of audience and, and they have all have similar concerns about protection of their own privacy and, and obviously conflict of interest. So, um, yeah, as soon as as soon as you we sort of start talking about that, I was like, I have this conversation every day. Um, I'm hoping this is the solution for me. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. So it, it, the same parallels exist in the world of M&A. Yeah. So if you're going to sell a company, you know, then you're kind of saying, I don't want my employees knowing, I don't want my suppliers knowing, mm -hmm. um, I don't want my competitors knowing. So there's a whole set of how can I do this? How can I do what I'm trying to do, but do it confidentially? Yeah. Um, in, you know, in, in the world of, uh, uh, you know, if you're buying, if in the world of M&A, if you're buying and selling a company, um, or if you're selling a company in particular, then often you're in a situation where you don't want your employees to know, you don't want your suppliers to know, uh, you don't want your competitors to know that you might be looking to sell. So this issue, you know, already exists in sort of parallel financial services industries. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that, you know, that, that historically has been done is you would hire an investment banker or corporate financier that would then confidentially market your opportunity to trade buyers, to investors accordingly without sort of, you know, Ma making it known, you know, in, in the wider circles. Mm -hmm. in, in our world of insurance, we do the same thing, uh, except we typically would use, you know, a placing broker, a binder broker, a reinsurance broker to again have some of those conversations. You might have some of those relationships yourself, but typically, you know, you'll have five relationships yourself. A broker will have 20 to 30, yeah. uh, but yet there's still, you know, 300 of them that are out there. And that's the bit of it, which is how do you do things? How do you get out there and talk to a number of different people, but do it confidentially so you don't trip over uh, your current discussions? 
Mm. Um, interesting enough, you know, I think, um, you know, when, when I was at Tempo, I would get approached by headhunters uh, about three times a week. Yeah. And they would say, I've got this great underwriter, you know, this great underwriting team that's looking to move. Uh, and they would say, here's their CVs. And I would, I would just be like, great. Um, my first question, do they have capacity? Mm. Um, because if securing capacity is long and painful process yeah. for everyone and, um, and it's gotten worse over the last few years. Mm. So it's, it's that bit of it, which is if they have capacity, if they don't have capacity, they're two different discussions mm. basically. Cause if you have to secure your capacity, like uh, I'm not really in the business of hiring people, you know, taking on big payrolls and then having them, uh, you know, then not having, you know, then having conversations that can go on for six, nine, 12 months with carriers to then secure capacity. It's just too high risk. Yeah. So that it was, it's one of the challenges of the model that currently exists. And it's one mm. of the challenges that I'm hoping capacity place solves um, mm. and you know with capacity place you know one of the things that we do is also talk to you know the, the headhunters can use the platform as well to say look I've got teams that are here they're looking for they're looking to move but they need capacity so um, if, if, if there's capacity interest that's there that actually helps me place them with so-and-so or so-and-so so that's you know it was designed with that in mind reflecting on my own experience, um, which is solve the big issue, which is capacity. Yeah. 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 So, um, so you, you built your own kind of model on WordPress, but, uh, presumably thought things have, things have kicked on from there. You've, uh, <laughs> you've, it's a bit more robust than that now. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, things were coming to an end really at tempo really in September, um, of last year. And, we were having some issues internally with Tempo and a legacy issue that existed. So um, I, I was struggling to grow the business and we just had, we, we were just having issues that were there. It was a good underlying business, but we had some legacy issues that I couldn't quite solve and resolve mm -hmm. um, accordingly. So I was getting kind of frustrated. Um, you know, the rest of the team, you know, was getting frustrated. And so I knew there was going to be a change. They knew there was going to be a change. And so it was just a question of, how and what do we do? Yeah. So at, at that time, you know, it was sort of a, there was a few different options that I was looking at in, in terms of things to explore. And then I was down in bottom, bottom. And, uh, you know, back in October last year, mm -hmm. and again, I went through the same thing, which was I was, I was giving demos of, of capacity place to a number of different people. And someone had said to me down there, they said, look, this capacity place is completely, tra completely transforms the market. This is completely, it modernizes the way that we do things in the London market. Why are you doing anything else? Why are you even considering anything else? This is what you should be doing. And that's when it hit me. It's like, you're absolutely right. I should absolutely be doing this. So it was really in bottom bottom last year, mm -hmm. end of October, early November, that I said, right, forget everything else, push everything else aside, 100% on capacity place. This is what I'm going to be focused on uh, for the next while. Yeah. So at that stage, then it was a question of, okay, if we're going to do this, what needs to be done? We've got this prototype. The prototype's built in WordPress. WordPress isn't the right platform um, mm -hmm. for doing this. It's good for you know, show and tell, but it's not very good in terms of, it's not commercial grade infrastructure. Yeah. So at that stage, what I did was I said, you know, do, you, do you then want to build out a team and infrastructure and build everything yourself? Or do you want to go down more of an agency route? And as I learned, um, and it's one of the things, you know, my learnings in the market is that one of the things that I discovered was, was over the last sort of three or four years, there's a number of marketplace platforms that are already exist, like white label marketplace platforms. Yeah. Now, most of those platforms aren't designed for this type of purpose, but they're designed more for, you know, if you've got, if you're buying and selling products, if you're buying and selling time, like an air, like an Airbnb model, yeah. if you've got services like an Upwork or a Fiverr um, or the like, there's different models that already exist, but a lot of the infrastructure is already there. So I, I made the call at that stage, which is well, rather than trying to build this from scratch, what we'll do is we'll configure, well, you know, we'll configure and develop on existing platforms. So then I went around a little bit of a beauty parade um, to a number of different firms, looked at what they were doing to find the ones that were really strong in a couple areas. So one was kind of marketplace technology to understand that buyer seller, and the other one was matching. Um, which is how do you match between buyer and seller? Like what's the right way of going about doing it? We've got a very unique thing here because it's kind of like a crossover dating agency 
um, where we're not so much transacting as we are putting the right people in touch mm -hmm. and then based on putting the right people in touch, figuring out the right structures that fit yeah. uh, for that. And that's sort of a capacity world, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like the bigger ticket M&A bit where, you know, there's a proposition that's there, but then someone might be interested in a portion of it, but not another portion or I have to buy it, but then I have to sell off some other parts of it, et cetera, et cetera. So we have the same thing in our capacity world where we have to look at, you know, what is incremental to that sits within someone else's portfolio. So there might be certain portions of it mm -hmm. or they might not have the licenses for it, but they've got the capacity interest for it, or they might have licenses, but don't have the capacity that sits behind it. And that's where we kind of get into the world of insurance, reinsurance, Lloyd's, um, you know, different, different types of vehicles in terms of what they can support. Everybody's kind of got a different angle um, based on their, based on sort of their size, capacity, rating, licenses, and their risk appetite. Everybody's looking to do different things. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to marry up opportunity with different sources of, of capital capacity. Yeah. That must be quite a challenge from your point of view, because we touched on briefly before we started recording that your your sort of target audience is is multifaceted because you've got you know reinsurers, insurers, you know um, capital market capital potentially, um, headhunters, uh, underwriters coming with teams. You know you've got all these kind of places that you've kind of got to draw. Is that is that one of the biggest challenges, kind of getting enough awareness on on in the different kind of customer segments? or user segments all the time. Yeah, so it was interesting. So when we started, yeah, there is an awful lot of different types of users that are out there. And when we went through the original design of this, um, one of our designers turned around and said, well, why don't you just, like when we were doing this whole thing, which is what type of company are you? And based on the type of company, we were trying to figure out, well, what, how do they play or what role do they play? And then he said, well, why don't you just divide everyone up into, like rather than doing that, why don't you just ask people, are you seeking capacity? Or are you providing capacity? And that for me, again, was another light bulb moment was mm -hmm. right. There's a massive dividing line here. You either have got capacity and you're providing it or you're seeking capacity. Yep. You can be all different types of companies that are seeking capacity. You can be all different types of companies that are providing capacity, but basically you're either on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. So that really helped with the definition of different users that are out there. Mm -hmm. Then within the world of uh, uh, seeking capacity, you're either seeking capacity for your own company or you're seeking it for a client. Yeah. So if you're a headhunter, basically you're seeking it for a client. If you're a placing broker, you're seeking it for a client. If you're an MGA, you're seeking it for yourself. If you're a wholesale broker, you're seeking it for yourself. If you're a bank insurer, you're seeking it for yourself. If you're a placing broker working for a, wholesale, for a bank insurer, then you're, then you're seeking it for your client. In yeah. any way though, that the, the models seem to have worked in terms of getting the stakeholders right. And that was that was one of the bigger sort of you know sort of design challenges around that. Mm -hmm. Then the next bit of it was okay. Well, how do you then structure the question set accordingly that then makes sense? So basically, we'll, we kind of made some calls to say the way this is going to work is we're going to kind of mirror the existing marketplace. So by mirroring the existing marketplace, I mean most capacity providers or underwriters are reactive. So they don't turn around and say, this is what I'm looking for in terms of programs. There's very few of them that are out there that actually proactively articulate out, here's what we're looking for. There's a few, but not many. Most of them are very reactive. Most of them are like, if I see something that I like, then I'll tell you. Yeah. So what we did is then modeled that like, and, and mirrored that in terms of our marketplace to say, fine. Then what that means is that capacity seekers need to prepare a program that then gets sent to the capacity providers and the capacity providers can then look at it and say, yes, I'm interested in discussing and exploring this further or no, I'm not. And that was the fundamental model um, in terms of the information flow that goes through. So capacity seekers create their program listing, capacity providers search, view, review program listings, and then make contact with the capacity seekers if they're interested. Yeah. Um, and, and that was, that's different than how other marketplaces or other networks work. Um, accordingly, because it's it's it more mirrors how our world of insurance works. Yes, yeah. And so, um, is the is the, is the platform completely live now? Is it people can go and use it now, or um, is it in a test phase, or where are you with it? Yeah, so we went live in June two thousand twenty. Mm -hmm. So it now has about two hundred fifty, two hundred sixty users up on there. There's about thirty seven, thirty eight, maybe thirty nine risk carriers live on the platform. 
There's about 25 to 30 programs uh, currently live on the platform uh, today as we speak, and there's, you know, there's another 25 to 30 that are coming on board. So okay. yeah, it's, it's up live, it's going, you know, all users can go on, they can register, the programs, uh, you know, capacity seekers can add programs, capacity providers can review programs um, on there, there's a demo that's on the site um, accordingly. The other thing that we've got on the site is a, is a program library, uh, it's a template library. So one of the things that, um, you know, being involved in the program space for you know, the last 10 years or so, um, the quality of information that I have seen and probably most people have seen in the program world is, uh, is pretty poor on average. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's terrible. And I'm, I'm sure even- I'm giving you a knowing laugh there about yeah. <laughs> the amount of times I'm confronted with teams are going, I need, I need, I need a lot more information than your CVs. And then, and it's, it's staggering how many people don't know what information to provide when you think, you know, it's so, so, so I'm sorry, I interrupted, but I just, uh, I could imagine what you receive on, on times in the past. You're hundred percent correct. And that's, that's the issue is that, is that they have no idea, you know, what is actually needed by capacity providers, you know, in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And I'll come on to that in terms of, because the information requirements have skyrocketed right. in recent years, but a lot of it came down to, you know, most of the underwriters that are in the market, like underwriters, uh, anyone that's looking for capacity, they yeah. typically tend to be good at their business, but they're not necessarily good at securing capacity and explaining to others what it is that they do. Mm. And why is it that someone should delegate? You know, every time you've got this, anytime you've got a delegated authority, someone is trusting you to do the right thing. Yes. Uh, so there's a whole, that element of trust is, is, is quite important. So when you trust someone, it's like, I, I really have to be clear in terms of how all these things work. And most of the time, companies that are seeking capacity don't aren't aren't really aware of that. They're like they've come out of different environments. They're not aware of all of the requirements that they have um, in that new world. Mm. Um, and so, uh, what we've done is we've created a number of templates for business plans, for underwriting guidelines, uh, for uh, delegated underwriting authority, for uh, some claims templates, NDAs, a few other things that show what good looks like. And what this does is, you know, with when a capacity, you know, when if a capacity seeker basically uses those templates and follows them, that will answer the vast, vast, vast majority of questions that are needed by capacity providers. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that we've seen certainly over the last 10 or 15 years is underwriters at capacity providers used to be able to make decisions around different programs. And because of this, you know, all the new requirements that have, that have come in over the last 10 or 15 years, and those have come because of solvency legislation, conduct regulation, um, and the like, it, it, it's meant that the amount of information that is needed has gone through the roof. And now every time a program comes in that needs to be looked at, it often needs to be considered then by a whole bunch of other departments, not just the underwriter. They'll need to go to an underwriting committee. The underwriting committee will say, yay or nay, this actually fits. So the first stage that underwriters are usually trying to do is, is just to qualify to say, does this opportunity look interesting? And is this something that we want to pursue? So, uh, and then they usually have to then refer to an underwriting committee, which is usually, you know, some different C-level, C-suite people that mm -hmm. then kind of make a call to say, yes, now go do a deep dive on this. Yeah. Once they then do that, they then have to then consult many, many other departments, actuary, finance, reinsurance, delegated authority, compliance, mm -hmm. um, quality control, IT, you know, you name it, the list goes on and on and on, yeah. depending on what the, the particular book looks like. Um, wordings, I mean, particularly, we just came out of the BI, you know, FCA BI case yeah. recently where many of the wordings there were MGA based wordings. So your wordings can become quite important in terms of the exposures that an insurer takes on. So all these things need to then be considered um, mm -hmm. accordingly that historically haven't really been there. So the amount of checks that are done now um, and the amount of processes that are there is far, far, far greater than it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Underwriters then, their roles are evolving from that. Usually, you know, historically, they were an, in, uh, you know, an indecision or an in-principle decision maker. So now mm -hmm. they're more like a project manager having to corral lots of different internal stakeholders to then collate mm -hmm. feedback to then go back to say, we need this information, this information, this information. Mm -hmm. We've gone from you know, what I think is a relationship-led 
business or business model to one that is far more information led as a starting point where relationships are important, but information is quite critical. Yeah. Um, even the underwriters themselves, you know, it used to be that I think underwriters used to spend 80% of the time underwriting and 20% on what are called compliance activities. Nowadays, it's probably 60% on compliance to 40% on underwriting. The yeah. amount of overheads that you need for reporting, um, you know, management, checking, peer review has gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. So that then corresponds back basically to any time you delegate authority, all those organizations also need to then be undertaking many of those same functions. Yeah. And, it, and what that means is that the, you know, the, the criteria, if you will, in terms of delegating authority is, is nowadays is actually more about, you know, do you have all the infrastructures in place as opposed to the specific underwriting expertise? Yes. And that's, that's, a, that's a change in mindset, if you will. Mm -hmm. I don't think the market is quite caught up with that. They still just focus on the underwriting and stuff. No, 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 no. You have to have all these other things in place yeah. in order to be successful. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it speaks to sort of the, 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 the direction things are going anyway. I mean, I, I think the, um, you know, you've got to look, look, take it back to banking. You, know, you used to walk in and um, you, you'd be lent money by the bank manager because he thought you were decent upstanding individual you know essentially it was it was relationship driven because you knew your bank manager and i think you know relationships are kind of continued and hiring decisions used to be made on on who people knew um and then you sort of move down to this kind of information age we're in now you know, like as you say sort of compliance is such a heavy part and, and kind of regulation is such a heavy part but then also kind of we've got so much more information now that we we can trade outside of just relationships and we can look at those other things um, and when you kind of look at the factors that people have to gather in, um, if you've got a streamlined way, you know, capacity place, if you can streamline that process and help with the, I think it's such a good way of looking at the project management of making these decisions, um, then, then that, makes, that makes this a lot easier. I do worry that uh, we're, we're putting it in a box where um, this is going to be an algorithm, and on, algorithm on every side of your um, capacity. <laughs> it could just be trading with each other. In theory, it could be done, I suppose. Uh, well, it's, you know, yeah. I think what we're trying to do is basically, <laughs> you know, there's an objective that I kind of had when we, when we kicked this off, which was I'm trying to take what's normally a nine-month process and say, how do you get that take it nine months and turn it into two months? Sure. And, you know, right now, if you look at the nine month process and say, what's going on? Well, basically you just have handoff, handoff, handoff. I don't have the right information. So I've got to go back, you know, and back and forth all over the place and saying, okay, well, how can we remove a lot of that elapsed time that takes place? Yeah. So yeah. when we analyze kind of that process in terms of the way things are done, there are many, many better, smarter, faster ways of, of doing things. So yeah. the first thing that we're trying to do is use marketplace technology. And what that means is that you go out to everyone at the same time, that you go out to everyone simultaneously, except for those that you don't want to see the program. So yeah. basically, you're getting a head start. You're not waiting for a broker to then talk to a business developer within a company to then get to the underwriter. Meanwhile, a month and a half has passed. Mm -hmm. So you, you, rather than doing things sequentially, you're going right to decision makers who, um, who can kind of look at things and say yay or nay right away. So you're yeah. taking out huge amounts of time. Yeah. So that's one of the areas of that in which you do that. Then we're using these, um, I think I mentioned before, you know, we use a lot of these templates, um, if you will, to then improve the quality of information so that there's a lot less back forth, back forth. This has got the information they, that underwriters need to qualify the opportunity, but also answer many of the questions that all these other internal stakeholders need. Mm -hmm. That's you know, sort of the second thing that we're doing. Then, mm -hmm. then we use a data room embedded within the platform um, as well to hold commercially sensitive documentation. So what that does is that then, you know, an underwriter who then turns around and says, ah, this is a really nice looking opportunity. I now need to do a deep dive on that. They can just invite other people from their organization into viewing that program and the data room that's on there. And so the data room becomes a single source of, of the truth rather than emails then flying around left, right, and center. I didn't get this, et cetera, et cetera. So it's more secure. It doesn't have the information risk issues uh, accordingly uh, that, that goes with it. So we're doing a number of things on that front to just say, how can we collapse the process, um, get to decision makers quicker, um, and expedite the review process, uh, expedite the due diligence process, to then make that happen. And as you know, you know, many books in the market, you know, many books are annually renewable. 
So the whole thing is, is that um, what you're trying to do is to say, I want to be able to make sure I can capture my renewal because if, if I lose that, the book is gone. You know, it's gone into all the competitors and therefore you've lost the opportunity. Yes. So a lot of this is, you know, there's a strategic reason why we're trying to do things much quicker um, is because it actually enables and creates opportunities that don't exist today. Yeah, that's a really important point. I mean, that, that's something that I've come across on a few times is that you're working on things that, you know, there's a specific date. And, um, you know, I work on a, I work on gathering information as much as I can. And one of the things is, is there an important date on your book? You know, is it an annual renewal type book? And if it is, you know, you can just see the timelines just won't make sense. It, it, you can't get it through because once you do, then you, the merry-go-round's gone past and you essentially are waiting another 12 months. Um, you know, obviously I'm talking from perspective of people trying to move um, their book and they're trying to move their team. Um, then you're then you're you're stuck on the merry go round again for another term before you can get off because because you've simply missed that window. Um, but it's usually because that capacity takes so long to acquire. So anything that can streamline it, but also kind of make it a manageable process, like that you can see the 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 things moving along. You can you know where you're communicating with because it's such a sporadic process. And for just from that perspective, from my perspective, it's such a kind of crazy convoluted meetings in coffee shops in pubs um even if it's in offices it's it's meetings with you know not necessarily all the right people or, and it's always trying to get people in the room and i think that's another thing that i think you know covid has taught us a lot um about working remotely but things like being able to have a secure place that people can review documents that means you don't have to have all hands in the room to review the documentation and talk through it so um it, there's so many obvious wins um and i'm obviously only looking at it from that headhunter perspective because that's uh, that's the one i see the most yeah the other thing i think we're trying to do is also create comp competition or what we call competitive intensity yeah so the whole thing is because the, the process is so slow typically once a carrier turns around and says i'm interested then everybody just waits they stop and they wait and they just hope that, that one's going to come through. Mm -hmm. But often it's one of those things where if there's two or three that are, you know, or four that are competing for that same book of business, a lot of it is, well, if you don't move, then, you know, these guys are going to move on it and they're going to take that book. Yeah. And that whole competitive intensity right now, you know, within the marketplace, particularly for delegated authority, it's weighted in favor typically of insurers. So it's one of those ones where if you can then, say, actually, we've got a better way of doing this and create that competitive intensity in there where there's greater competition for books of business, mm -hmm. then, um, then that means that many of those departmental reviews that are often taking place, like if actuary, if our actuarial department is backed up um, uh, or, you know, our legal and wording reviews are backed up because they're focused on something else, those are just inevitable delays to this program. Yeah. As soon as you know that, that actually, if we don't do this, that somebody else is going to come in and, and um, they're going to support this particular book, then that actually puts pressure on that to then get things over the line quicker. Mm. And right now that doesn't really exist. It's, you know, it's, it's a, that manual process by which, you know, we go to, you know, from, you know, uh, to carry to carrier and, you know, maybe we may have a couple of, uh, of, of carriers that are interested, but it's, it's, that's the process that, um, that you can actually take out a lot of time because it's about organizing departments to focus on the things that get the deal over the line. Mm. And then everyone's got competing priorities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, that's been really comprehensive. Um, I'm really conscious of your time. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, uh, I think that's a really good part to end on, but um, importantly for everyone that's watching this, um, where's the best place for people to reach out to you? Obviously they can go to the, the website, which uh, the address is. <laughs> it's a uh, it's www.capacityplace.com someone wants to reach out to you to find out a little bit more maybe in a bit more detail what what's the best method for doing that uh it's uh, just email me uh at mdelcarlo at capacityplace.com i'm also on linkedin uh, i'm pretty easy to reach so um you know if you type in my name online uh you'll you'll get hold of me mm -hmm. but you know email phone um uh linkedin um any any of the above uh you can reach me I'm not really a twitter user uh, <laughs> you know, or, or facebook um i you know use that more for personal use yeah. but uh, the rest of them yeah I'm quite easily accessible i'm also yeah. on whatsapp 
Yeah, brilliant, Marco. That's that's great. I, I think such a it's such a transparently good idea. And um, as soon as I saw it, I I kind of had this thing of surely someone's done that before. And I think the best ideas always feel like that because you go, well, this is such an obvious win. So look, I wish you all the best, and um, thank you so much for spending some time with me this morning. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me. I really greatly appreciate it. Thank you.